I want to start with saying that the value of hardware is, the value of VR is not in the hardware that everybody can provide, it's really in the applications that we will make of it. And if you look at TV right now, nobody is talking about the TV, nobody is talking about the hardware, everybody is talking only about the content. So that's really what I want to talk about. So that's me when I was a little kid with my first hand-mounted display. <laughs> so this really proves I liked VR before, before it was cool. So I started my career in VR uh, 13 years ago, first at the French Railways doing some training simulators. I will be able to show you some videos of that. Then I joined uh, Virtuals, which was a very popular 3D engine back at the time, before Unity, and I was in charge of adding virtual reality devices, stereoscopy, clustering to this engine. And I'm now the, the founder and president of a company called Middle VR. And so, really, our goal is to simplify the creation of virtual reality applications. And we have developed a plugin called Middle VR for Unity, and we're also working on Unreal. So here's really quickly what it does. So that's the 1.6 version. Can you cut the sound, please? That's a nice sound, but we don't need it here. So that allows you to use any kind of VR devices. So you can have used the Oculus Rift, Limotion, Razer Hydra, Kinect. And originally, this was made to use for high-end VR systems like this one. So this is called a cave. And this is really a big room in which all of the walls are projected with 3D projectors. And we are completely tracked in this environment. Thank you. And you can see that you can look around, you can move. So it has really big field of view, low, uh, high resolution, low latency. And this is actually quite a small one. So how you use middle VR quickly, you just have one drag and drop. And then you have instantly rich interactions with it. You have navigation in your 3D models. You have interaction with objects. We also now, with the new version, provide immersive menus so that you can configure your application in your VR world. You can also create your own graphical user interface using HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS. You can display web pages from inside the VR world. And for example, if you wanted to add knowledge to your VR world, you can just connect that in your training simulation, for example. Or you can just display videos and you also have the sound with it. Also, if your head or your hand is going too close to a real wall or real table, we warn you that beware, you're about to physically hurt yourself, so stop it here. <laughs> so next things, we are going to add avatars and of course, remote collaboration. Not yet, not yet. <laughs> so first, this is the plan. I'm going to introduce what is virtual reality for me, and then we're going to talk about the value of VR for engineering, marketing, training, architecture, scientific visualization, health, and maybe others. So quickly, I'm happy that this new definition of VR, which is feeling present in a virtual world, has really catch up. Because really, for me, that's exactly the point of difference between interactive 3D and real VR. So you can feel immersed, either using a head-mounted display, a big stereoscopic wall, or the cave, as we've seen before. What's interesting when you get presence is that you get natural interactions. So you don't have any buttons or keyboard shortcuts to, to learn. If you want to look under a table, you just, just move and you look under a table. And you will also get natural reactions and natural emotions. So if I throw a ball at somebody in a virtual world, you will have the reflex to catch it. So that's natural reactions. And if I put you in front of a high cliff, you will have fear of heights. So you have natural emotions. But you have to know that this feeling of presence, your application is not this experience. What's really happening is that this experience is in your brain. So what we as developers are working with is not hardware, it's not software, we're really working with the human brain. So we have to understand how it works, how it perceives, and then we can play with it. So this is your brain, or at least mine. And presence can be said to be split into two levels. So you have the first level, which is really the level of the mind. You're fooling the mind into thinking he's in another reality. And this happens when you're reading a book, when you're playing video games, when you're reading a story, or when you're playing a movie. But what really 
VR ads is fooling the body, fooling the senses. This is called perceptive presence. And there only virtual reality can add this layer. And you can really say that this is fooling the animal brain, the instincts. This is where you will get the emotions and natural reactions. And really, your body is involved. And that's really the only medium in which your body is really involved. And Michael Abrash said that once you get really present, you have to make a conscious effort to remember that you're not in natural reality. So that's really the point of presence. So yeah, you're fooling all the senses. And in my definition of VR, you look ridiculous. If you don't look ridiculous, then it's probably not real VR. So you have Futurama, some French ministers, Marty McFly. So what is VR today? You might probably think that VR is reborn with the Oculus Rift, but in fact, VR really never died. For the last 20 years, it has been used in the industry. For example, Peugeot, since 1999, Peugeot is a French car manufacturer. They, they have been investing $9 million in VR. And Renault, also another French car manufacturer, has just bought a new VR system for $4 million. And in 2018, it's estimated that the market should be around $5 billion mixed with hardware and software. So that's estimated by the firm called K0. And I've put some logos here of a few companies that were using VR even before the Oculus Rift. So you have car manufacturers, the aerospace, packaging, defense, entertainment. And so I think it's used because VR is used to really to improve reality. It's saving lives, it's saving time, and it's saving money. So why is it interesting to get into VR now? And also, why is it interesting for VR to arrive now? We shifted from an economy of goods in which, with money, you could buy items. You could buy a hammer, for example. Then we went into an economy of services. You could buy a haircut, for example. And we're now really in an economy of experience. So if you go to Starbucks coffee, you're not just buying a coffee. You have the whole Starbucks experience. And if you're going to Disney World, you also have the Disney World experience. You're not buying any good or service. And it can be said that VR is really the ultimate experience, and VR can simulate all the other experiences. You also have a democratization going on. You have all the 3D trackers that are getting cheaper, uh, projectors getting cheaper, and of course, head-mounted displays getting cheaper. And I often say that we are the prehistory of VR, but in March, I was able to test the Oculus DK2, Sony Morpheus, and Valve's prototype, and I was blown away. So now I, I say that we are We've lived the Big Bang of VR, so it's coming at you very quickly. So now on to the real topic, which are the applications. So let's start with engineering. So before VR, the engineers were using physical mockups, like this wooden mockup here. So this has some advantages, but lots of disadvantages also, because it costs a lot. It takes time to create. For example, it can take up to six months. It's not easily modifiable. And there's a limit in size of what you can create with a physical mock-up. You cannot create a whole factory or a big boat. That's quite complicated. And also, it requires some very specific skills, like woodcrafting. And I know nothing about woodcrafting. Then the engineers, they switch to CAD models in 3D. But this really creates a wall between the virtual product and the real human that want to interact with it. Also, it's not scale one, so you don't have the real size of the product in front of you. It's not very intuitive to understand, so only engineers can understand that. You cannot perceive the volumes, and the interactions with that are pretty complex. It's mouse, keyboard, complex menus. So now engineers are starting to use VR. So instead of having a physical mockup, you have a virtual mockup. And so that's, this has a lot of advantages. You don't have any physical waste. It's very easier to modify, and it's much more, you get much more natural interactions with it. Really, the first advantage is that this breaks the screen barrier. You're really inside with your model. And you get really the scale one models. They're really just in front of you. And this works for small products. It works for cars, and it works for complete factories. In fact, there is no limit to the size of what you can simulate in VR. It's also a natural communication tool. So now you have everybody that's working on the project. Everybody can come together and understand what the project is about. So you can have designers, engineers, marketers, ergonomists, stakeholders, end users, everybody communicating with the same natural language that is this virtual mockup. 
Also, you can have distant collaboration, and that's pretty magical because now you can work with people that are not physically in the same space that, but are completely all around the world as if they were here. So you have better collaboration and, of course, less travel, which is also good for the planet. VR can help you validate your design. And that's really magical because when you're in VR, you just see some errors. For example, if I'm sitting in a car, I can see that maybe some part of the car is too big, so I'm not seeing a big part of the road. But what's even better is that I can simulate, okay, maybe I'm somebody taller, so I have other problems, maybe at the top of the car that's blocking me, and I can simulate by being somebody shorter, so maybe there are other parts of the car that's blocking me. So you can really test with a wide variety of users. You can identify conception errors very early, and that's really a key factor because it's much cheaper to find errors early in the process than much later because you may have to re-engineer things, change the factories, everything. You also get faster iterations. You can quickly test multiple design variations. And for example, last year, Ford, the car manufacturer, they've been evaluating 100,000 details on more than 200 virtual vehicles, so they've been able to test really an impressive amount of details in VR. You also have the ability to risk new ideas, so that's really reducing the cost of trying to innovate, and if you're not afraid to fail, you will have better innovation. Also, you may want to just design from within the environment. For example, here, this is testing the layout of a minibus, so you can test the position of chairs, you can see one in this position, will the avatars, will the real humans have their knees touching? So maybe you have to change something, you can do that in real time. Also, of course, you can change the colors, the textures, and if, uh, if you don't have something from your 3D library, you can just draw it from within the space and you can quickly test design ideas. Oh, okay, maybe I could put an object here, maybe I can do that, and you can really see immediately what's going on. I love that. You can, of course, test the acceptability of your products. You can evaluate the perceived quality. You can evaluate the colors, textures, volumes. And it's also very easy to compare multiple design variations. And you can really bring your end users with you in this mock-up. And you can really combine the engineering practices with the voice of the users. Also, you can use it for ergonomy and usability testing. And you can validate the interactions between human and products. For example, if you have an onboard computer, you can test that in VR while you're driving the virtual car and see if you have a high cognitive load, are you able to change the radio station without killing yourself, for example. That's better to do that in VR. And it works not only for cars, but really for any product or environment. So that's a real application by Miel. And I have a very concrete example in which my mom, last year, she bought a kitchen. And when she received it, she was not able to reach the top of the fridge. So she was very annoyed with that. And she, if she had been able to test the, the kitchen before in VR, she would have known immediately, I cannot reach it. Maybe we can change the design. And it would have saved us a lot of time. You can also use that to validate if you're able to construct what you will want to do. So you can really have people trying to manipulate these things. So for example, here you can have, okay, am I able to fit the motor inside my car? So if it's not possible, maybe you have to change your design. And once you have validated that you can construct that, will you be able to maintain your product? Will you be able to repair it once it's finished? So for example, will the operator be able to have his hand here and maybe find a screw and unlock it? And if it's not able to do that, you have to change your design. So you can retest that with virtual avatars. And also one other great application is that you can have ergonomic analysis of posture. So if you're on an assembly line, you're doing always the same gestures. What's really interesting is that you can have a virtual avatar tell you that if you do this too much, stay here, maybe you will start to have back problems at one point. So if you're doing this gesture all day long, maybe you have problems with this one. So you can really evaluate that in VR and prevent injuries and maybe also optimize the procedures. So this also leads to better acceptation of the work environment by the operators because they have been involved in the creation process. And you can also train the operators on the assembly line, for example, even before the assembly line really exists. So what are the challenges of bringing VR to engineering? The first one would be acceptability. A lot of times when we present VR, the first thing that people think is they say, oh, that's cool, but that's for games, right? 
And so it takes quite a lot of time to explain to them. And at one point, they get to the point they say, OK, this will change everything. But you have to take time. The other challenge is getting the 3D data in the VR world. So if the data does not exist yet, you have to create it either by scanning the object or by having a 3D artist create the environment. And if the data already exists, it might be complicated to get it from a CAD model to a real-time environment. So that are a few of the challenges that are often overlooked. Another problem is also the touch. How do you interact with an object? So that's really um, complex problems, and it will take time to fix. But here's just a quick example. This is a big haptic arm by the French company called Haption. And you're manipulating the yellow piece here, and you're trying to test if the piece fits inside the door of the car. And if it doesn't, the robotic arm is blocking your arm, and you're not able to move. So you can really feel if the piece can fit inside the door or not. That's really physical interaction. So what is the real value of engineering? It really helps lower the product design times. It increases the quality of your products, increases the confidence in your project. You have reduced risks. You can get more innovation. You have better acceptability of the product and the work environment. And you also have cost savings. And at this point, a lot of people ask, OK, but do you have some numbers? Can you prove, really, by numbers, with dollars, how much VR can save for my company? And that's really something that's hard to explain and hard to measure, because how can you evaluate what you have saved by identifying an error very early in the process? If you have identified the problem, maybe you have a stair that is not correctly placed. You have to change the whole design. And just moving this stair is probably more expensive than buying a VR system and having worked with that. So let's move to marketing. Who is doing some marketing here? Cool. OK, so the first application in marketing would, of course, be advertisement. And the first thing is just it's cool and new, so people will just like it. But I think the most interesting part is that you can really create powerful experiences. So for example, you can have somebody flying in a wingsuit and having free fall. So you're really getting strong emotions. And that's really going to create a strong customer engagement to your brand. And even though this virtual world is virtual, the emotions that you feel are real. It can also be used to, for market studies. So you can really evaluate and Thank you, thank you. You can really evaluate and iterate quickly over the store layout. You can change how things appear. You can iterate quickly also on the product packaging. You can record and analyze the movement of the user in the store. You can record where he's looking at, which product he's taking, where he's looking at the product, if he's buying it, putting it back. So that's really a great, powerful tool. And this is used by Kimberly Clark and Proto Gumble, for example. And you could even go beyond reality for marketing. You could have a virtual showroom, and you can show all the variations, for example, of a car, all the colors, all the options, everything together. And although in the real life, the real space is limited and very costly, in virtual space, you have an infinite space, and that's very cheap. You could also have some remote sales. So you can really capture clients from all around the world and not just clients that are local. So you have the avatar of the, the, avatar of the clerk here, and you can reach clients really everywhere as if it were local. So for marketing, this VR gives you a high-tech image. You can create some buzz because it's still quite new. You should have increased revenues, increased customer engagement, and this should reduce the time and cost of designing your product and stores. So what about training? So real training, that was before VR. That was boring. That was not engaging. And it was not tailored to each individual. And really, for me, training is one of the most fascinating applications of VR. And for example, this is the first application I have been working on in the French, French railways 13 years ago. So this is used to train a driver to perform uh, some procedures on the tracks. He has to get down from the train because there is a problem and he has to go on the, somewhere and do these procedures. He has to open a box, get some keys, has to perform various actions in a very particular order. 
And so this procedure, it's rare to do it in the real life, but when you have to do it, you have to be prepared and you have to know it by heart. And in real life, they have to go on a real line, they have to block the line, it costs a lot of time, they have to go there, you're losing time. But in VR, you can, everybody can actually practice the procedure and you can practice on day, on night, with rain. And we also have a treadmill because the, the, the driver has to understand the time that he's taking to do this, this procedure because after 30 minutes, they have to refund the clients in the train, so that's complicated. And the second application was about inspecting wagons before they go on the rails. So you can have lots of different issues on different wagons. And each type of wagon has some very specific issues on its own. So here you can really train somebody on any type of situation on any wagon, whether it be on day, night, in rain. And what's great is that you don't need a large area of tracking. You just need a very small space for tracking. And you can duplicate this site everywhere. And you, you can have really specific scenarios in which you have different wagons and for everybody, the, the wagons can be really different, whether in real life, you have the same wagon with the same issues for everybody, so that's not very practical. Another surprising application, so that's me with a nice hat. I'm learning how to practice to apply isolation coating material on houses. So the depth of the coating has to be very regular on the holder surface, and this actually depends on the speed of the gesture and the orientation of the hand. So what's really great with this application is that you're practicing the perfect gesture and you're saving on expensive material because this material was really costly. And what's great also, you can record, you can analyze everything so the trainer has a real record of everything that's happening and say, okay, see when you were turning around, your gesture was not correct, so we can see that here that the coating is not correct, so you have to work again. And one guy, one day he said, tell me and I will forget, show me and I may remember, involve me and I will understand. Who was that? For one million dollars? Okay, Confucius. And one of the first advantage of VR in training is that you get better motivation because just it's new. So people say, oh, okay, that's new, let's do this. Then it's also easier to use because you have natural interactions and you're really practicing the real gestures that people will do in real life. And what's even better is that you could have a robotic arm, as we've seen before, that could guide, for example, the hand of a surgeon to do the exact perfect gesture. So instead of just looking at somebody, you could have the robotic arm that is showing you the perfect gesture that has been recorded on the master of surgery somebody somewhere in the world. So you can really repeat the gesture until you master them. It's not you have five hours of training. You, have, you train until you master the process. You can record, analyze, replay, so a great tool for trainers. And what you have learned in real life transfers, uh, what you have learned in VR transfers in real life because you've done the real gestures and your body remembers that. You can, of course, also practice procedures. You can have mission planning. If you wanted to learn how to rescue hostages, you can prepare that before disaster evacuation, traffic accident. And before that, we these guys were practicing with, by reading a checklist of what it has to do. They were not really practicing. And when they were practicing, for example, uh, disaster evacuation, they had to hire an incredible number of actors that was very expensive. They also had uh, expensive medical mannequins. They had to describe clothes. And with VR, you can really practice that in a, as many times as needed in a stressful environment and you can really control all the parameters of the simulation. So it can even be adapted in real time, depending on the performance of the learner. So you can change the parameters, more stress, less stress. And so really the number of scenarios is infinite with VR. And of course, training is really useful if the object or environment you want to train on does not exist yet. So for example, you can train on the future assembly line that does not exist yet. So once it's built, you're immediately ready to work on it. And also it's interesting if the object or environment cannot be used or monopolized. For example, you have a combat aircraft, you cannot have 20 students working on the maintenance of that because it has to be ready to go anywhere. So you can practice on a virtual prototype. 
It's also great because you can practice rare and dangerous and expensive situations. So for example, you can learn how to manipulate electricity. So you should not do that, for example. And so you have easy, easy accessibility. So you can just have one VR system that's always ready in the training room. And you can really duplicate the training sites all over the world for the really cheap, you have reduced costs, and you can also save material as we've seen. But it's not finished, there's even more. You can change the world scale. You can be at the size of the universe. You can be at the size of a molecule. You can change the time scale. You can have some things. You can observe the action in slow motion, in fast motion. You can visit the past. You can visit the future. You can do whatever you want. And you can even go beyond reality, just not mimicking the reality. But you could simplify reality. So you could have, for example, the uh, engine of a car that is simplified so that you can really understand the relation of each part with each other. You can show invisible effects. So for example, I could show under the floor where are the cables. You can have show me only the electric, cable, uh, electric cables, only the phone cables. And you can also, if you want, display surface tension, see the stresses somewhere. You can display infrared. You can display the heat. You can really show whatever physical data that you want. Another crazy example is that you can use for communication. So that's an application of the University of Florida. This was used to train doctors to announce bad news. So in this example, it was used to say, OK, you have a cancer. And this is not something that doctors are trained for in the university. So you can use VR to train on virtual patients. And what's even better is that you can replay the scene from the point of view of the patient. And then you can see how you've announced the news. And you can see, oh, maybe that was not very delicate. Maybe I have to change that. And you're raising empathy. But this could also be used for training in crisis. For example, you have an angry customer coming to the shop. How do you react to that? It can be used for training in pub training to speak in public. So I should have done that. And what's really great is that you don't need to have actors. You can have any number of virtual avatars in front of you, and you can have them react nicely or strongly. So you can really train in any kind of situation. So the value of VR for training, your body is involved, it's more efficient, it's more accessible, the costs are reduced, the risks are reduced, the waste is reduced. Now also a word on architecture, but you would be surprised that architects are not using 3D and VR so much as you would think. And I, I was the first to be surprised, so there are various reasons to that, but they're slowly getting to it, and we will help them with that. But it can be used and there are lots of the same advantages as engineering. It can be used to replace physical mock-up, to experience the building or the environment from the point of view of a human and not from a godlike point of view that nobody will ever experience. You can use that for marketing as a communication tool before the, the house is built. You can visit it, for example. You can also change colors, textures, and... Uh, Another example is that you can see the clashes between cables from electricity and those from air conditioning. So that's not something that you see in 2D plans, but when you look at that in VR, you immediately see the problems without running some complex analysis. You can, of course, identify usability issues. If you take the example of the kitchen from my mind, that would be one example. But you could also maybe test the uh, wheelchair access of a museum, of a big building, and really you can evaluate the emotions of people. So how do you feel in this space? How do you feel about the colors? How do you feel about the light at this particular time of day? You can change everything. So for VR, it can be said that the value of VR would be to reach decisions faster because everybody's working together on the same natural virtual prototype. You have better acceptability and quality of your project because clients have been involved with it. You have reduced costs and risks about your project and lower product design times. And you can also risk, take risk in the design, evaluate, this, evaluate that, test them, and so you get more innovations also. So what about scientific visualization? You can use that to analyze big data in an intuitive way because you have more natural interactions. You don't have keyboard mouse, you just look around. 
And really, this works because our brain is a huge pattern matching machine. So really just by looking around and moving, say, aha, now I understand this surface. So for example, this can be used to visualize geological layers or um, virtual wind tunnel simulations or interaction of physics particles that you can really understand. One of the big advantages, again, is that you have non-realistic rendering. Again, you can display surface tension. You can display temperature. You can get a natural understanding of all those data. My last example will be about health. So, about health, this works because you're transferring your real body to a virtual body. And so you can be yourself, you can be somebody different, somebody different, or somebody completely different. And once you have transferred your, virtual, your body in a virtual body, something strange happens is that you have, you're afraid for your virtual body. So for example, here, that's an application in which you are very high. And if I, even if I'm not very subject to fear of heights, in this simulation, you have fear of heights. So that's something that's not really been done yet. Hmm, I should do that for the Oculus, I mean. And so what's really great is that it helps therapists helping people during they have their phobia. And so you can trigger the phobia with virtual spiders, virtual dogs, virtual planes, and the environment is completely controlled. So if the patient freaks out, you can just lower the intensity of the, of the simulation, you can just cut it off. And what's even more interesting is that you can go also beyond reality. So it seems that I've heard about one patient that were, was afraid of spiders. Thank you. And at one point, they showed a huge spider in the room, and he was not afraid of this big spider. And he said, OK, if I'm not afraid of this big spider, why should I be afraid of small spiders? And bam, he was cured. Second example was a lady, she was afraid of heights, so she was running ther therapy for that, and she was near a high cliff in VR, and at one point, we don't know what happened, but she decided to jump virtually, and so she fell, and at this point, she realized that in real life, she had control over what she wanted, over if she wanted to jump or not, so this also completely cured her instantly because she knew she had control and she would not fall in real life. And as incredible as it may seem, you can also reduce the drug usage in VR. So for example, because pain is really highly subjective. If you're not thinking about your pain, you will have less pain. And so VR can be used to help uh, burn patient victims. And when you're changing the bandages of these victims, that's extremely painful. So you can put the patient in a VR world, and he will be focusing about something else than his pain, and you're really reducing the pain. And you also reduce the usage of drugs in this experiment, so that's really great. Another example, it, it can improve the confidence in yourself. So that's an experiment that was done in Stanford. So they put you in a virtual avatar, and you're looking at a virtual yourself in a mirror, and they've been doing two experiments. One is you have a nice avatar, and the other one you have a less nice avatar. <laughs> so that's not the avatars they really used. That's just an example of what we could do. And you look at yourself in this virtual mirror, and it has been proved that the people that looked with the nice avatar, they tended to display more confidence, more friendliness, and more extraversion. And what's really crazy is that this confidence transfers in the real life. So one hour later, they took those guys, they say, okay, that's a completely different experiment, please go on this dating site and date girls. And they've shown that people that had the nice avatar were getting to reach the better looking dates that they would do from the less attractive avatars. So imagine what this could be used for in marketing. You could have an environment creating, for example, by Coca-Cola, in which you would feel better, have a stronger avatar, and you will feel good, and you will have a strong engagement to this brand. So don't do this example, it's a bad example, but you could do that. So in fact, it could be said that in some way that's better than drugs because you feel better about yourself without ingesting any, any strange things. 
can also be used to improve empathy. So for example, this is an application to understand a very specific visual impairment trouble, which is called a tubular vision. So you either see only a very small part of vision or you have a big spot in the middle in which you don't see anything. So with VR, you can really leave this condition. You can understand how maybe your relatives are living that. And this can also help you design the apartment in a better way. So for example, here, they have high contrast around the objects that are relevant. So you can test the design with those people. And this really works of, create, of creating empathy for lots of different disabilities. For example, you can live the life of somebody in a wheelchair really understand how it feels to struggle in a city that's not meant for that. So you can live as somebody having Parkinson's, so you have your virtual hand trembling, and then you understand, okay, maybe I should be more patient to those people. This can also go further. This is an application by Noni de la Peña called Hunger in Los Angeles. And you're in the line of a food bank, and at one point, this big guy here is having a seizure, so he falls down, because he has diabetes and he's not able to get food on time. And at this point, you're really frustrated because you're in VR and you cannot help him. And that's really frustrating. And so when you get out of the simulation, you say, okay, I want to do something for this type of problems and issues of society. I want to get involved because I've lived it. So this could be a great tool, great tool for organizations to raise awareness of problems instead of the ice bucket challenge, for example. I will not be talking about that, but you can also use VR to improve motor skill rehabilitation if you had a seizure. Thank you. And just a word of warning, do not try to apply VR to each and everything, because sometimes just having an iPad app in 3D works perfectly, and maybe better than VR. Because VR can add some constraints, so you have to add some hardware. The 3D interactions, this is something that's a bit new that we have to get used to. And uh, there's still this problem of Nogia also that we have to overcome. And then you could ask, okay, so why use VR? And I would say, why not use VR? That would be the opposite. Because with VR, you get presence. And with presence, you, get, you can really put the human back in the center. So no screens, nothing. Put the human back and get natural interactions, emotions, and reactions. So we could say that one picture is worth 1,000 words. One movie is worth 1,000 pictures. You see me coming. One VR app could be worth 1,000 movies. So if you do the math, that's a lot of words that the VR app is worth. And so my final message is, is VR dangerous? So I really think that VR can be dangerous, but as any new tool is dangerous. The TV, radio, internet, everything can be used in a bad way. And I think VR is more powerful than all those new mediums. Think about how we can manipulate your self-image as we've seen before. That's really something that can be scary, but can also be good, also be used in a good way to really improve the world. So in conclusion, we've seen that VR has been used in the industry by professionals for the last 20 years. And thanks to presence, you get natural interactions, emotions, reactions and can be used to analyze, communicate, and experience products or environment. And I don't know what will happen with the consumer market, but I know that the professional market will continue and grow, and it will use the VR environment. And really what I want is that VR is not used to escape reality, but to improve reality in return. So thank you very much. I think we have one minute for questions. Yes. Cool.
So for it to work just for your brain, doesn't have to be really complex, it can just be in cube in a wireframe, it will work. But for, also it doesn't have, you shouldn't make it too realistic because you have to leave the user put his own imagination and put his own fears in that. So if you put too, many, too much details, you will not be able to relate to the environment. So you have to leave that out and find the right balance. So I don't know what the balance is, but you have to test with the users to see that. One more question. Oh, you know everything. Ah, oh, yes, please. Um, thanks. So um, you talked a good amount about um, professional applications using more advanced technology, or more expensive technology, I should say. Um, <coughs> I'm wondering how far you think something like the Rift has to go before it can uh, cover those same applications? I think it can already cover those applications. <laughs> so you have different usage. If you're in a cave, you can see your own body. That's something that's still a bit complicated with the Rift. You don't see your own body. You can see people around you, and you can more easily collaborate still when you're in a cave. <laughs> but with the Rift, you're completely somewhere else, and you can change your own body, you can be some, somebody else. So that's one of the things that may help you choose from one to the other. And also high-end VR systems, they, have, they can have infinite resolutions, you just have to add more projectors, you can have huge size. So that's really a balance between what you want to do. Is the, uh, is the sort of body and hand tracking in those systems really, really good, or? It's more rudimentary. Yeah, it's, it's very good, low latency and very high precision. Yeah. Okay, I think we should go say happy birthday to Palma now. Thank you very much.